Hi students, let's discuss some of the commonest hand disorders that is being frequently asked in your exams. So learning hand disorders is like you know it's a lateral learning not like a vertical learning. So what's the difference between lateral learning and a vertical learning? Lateral learning means you're going to read about a number of topics or you're going to learn about a number of topics. So instead of going into the details or the depth of each topic you have to know the different varieties bits and pieces at least one or two or two or three important points regarding each topic rather than going into an in-depth one. So this is quite of interesting once you consider reading the again and again regarding the same topic. This creates a moment of curiosity, all those interest uh, generating topics. Again, this session is uh, really important for your future PG entrance exam where you will cover a lot of MCQs in this hand sessions part. So here we are going to rush through all those topics because it's all just one one slide regarding each topic. Uh, but it will be really kind of you know easy to learn for you guys. So your contents, you know, the anatomy definition of epidemiology in case of trauma, you have to add the mode of injury, the pathology in case of any, uh, you know, uh, cold disorders, clinical features, investigations, uh, your management part, surgical or non-surgical and the complications. Now, right, right away, we'll go mallet finger. What is a mallet finger? It's otherwise known as a baseball finger, a drop finger or a cricket finger. So cricket finger, what happens in a cricket field? A, a fielder tries to catch a ball, the commonest injury. And the ball rightly lands over his finger. Okay. So once a ball with force falls over your finger, this finger goes for hyperflexion. It goes for flexion. So that much amount of swift or sudden hyperflexion can cause the insertion of the extensor digitorum over your distal phalanx to get evulsed or even ruptured from the distal phalanx base. So you can see rightly over the diagram. So this is your uh, extensor tendon insertion rightly over here and this gets evils from the base of the distal phalanx. So that is your classical mallet finger. So what happens once the distal phalanx, the extensor digitorum uh, tendon is evils from the distal phalanx, your extension is lost. You know, the function of the extensor digitorum is the extension. So the extension is lost so that you will have a drop of the finger or the finger drop or the distal phalanx will be DAP joined in the attitude of flexion. So now you go into the topic anatomy, extensor tendon is evils from the base of the uh, distal phalanx. Mode of injury, I told you the cricket ball falls, the sudden passive flexion of the DAP joint, clinical fits the DAP joint is in flexion. Radiology, in case of some amount of bone being evils from the uh, muscle attachment, you can see a bone fragment. So that's a bony mallet we call. Operative and non-operative management, if it's bony, if the uh, tendon is not displaced too much, you can have an extensor splint or otherwise not a mallet splint in DAP joint hyperextension. So you can see all the diagram, there's a classical mallet splint. Or in case uh, if tendon alone is ruptured, you may have to go for a pull-out stitches. So caver fixation or the pull-out stitches for the mallet finger. So that was the mallet finger. So just the opposite of mallet finger is jersey finger. So mallet finger is your extensor digitorum insertion evolution from the base of distal phalanx. Now, if the flexor digitorum profundus FDP gets evolved from the distal phalanx base, it is your it is your jersey finger. So you can see the jersey finger. I have added one more point to just to remind you guys regarding jersey finger. It's a, again for your MCQ purposes mainly. So jersey finger is just the opposite of mallet. Mallet is for extensor, extensor tendon rupture whereas jersey finger is for flexor tendon rupture. Now moving ahead, we'll have the boutonniere and the swan neck deformity. Very, very important topics. And once you hear this terminology boutonniere or swan neck or buttonhole, you have to remember regarding rheumatoid arthritis because these are the classical uh, hand deformities seen in patient affected with a rheumatoid arthritis. So the boutonniere deformity as well as the swan neck deformity. So again, these are just the opposite of one another. In boutonniere deformity, the attitude is PAP joint, the proximal interferential joint flexion, DAP joint, distal nodular joint extension. So this is the boutonniere deformity. So just the opposite of this one. That means the PAP joint is in hyperextension and the DAP joint is in flexion. This is your swan neck, like the neck of a swan. So this is swan neck deformity, hyperextension of the PAP and the flexion of the DAP, whereas your boot nerve is just the opposite, the flexion of the PAP joint as well as the extension of the DAP joint. So what happens in a boot nerve deformity? If you imagine the anatomy of your extensor tendon in the finger, uh, my drawing, drawing skills are not that great, I'm just, you know, for your knowledge purpose for convenience I am writing. So this is your distal phalanx, this is your proximal phalanx and this is your, uh, no sorry, middle phalanx and this is your proximal phalanx. So the extensor tendon will come like this, the extensor tendon will come like this and it has got a central slip which gets inserted in the middle phalanx. 
and two lateral slips go and insert at the distal phalanx. So, this is the anatomy of a extensor digital tum. So, this central slip is getting involved in case of this in case of boot or deformity. So, what happens? The extensor tendon central slip is abelsed or is destroyed or disrupted from the middle phalanx attachment so that the PAP goes into flexion and the DAP goes into hyperextension. And in case of a this uh, swan neck deformity, your main problem is your flexion of the DAP as well as hyperextension of the proximal interphalanx. So, this hyperextension occurs because the volar plate gets disrupted at the PAP joint. So, this is the volar plate disruption whereas here it is the central slip position. So, just remember that. So, this is the Bottner and swan neck and rheumatoid arthritis is your buzzword for this deformity. Now, going ahead trigger finger. All those trigger fingers, decurvent stenosynovitis, carpal tunnel syndrome for orthopedic practicing orthopedicians, it they are all the disorders of a housewife, like a middle-aged female kind of disorders. So, what's the trigger finger? What's the trigger? The trigger of a gun. It's like pulling the trigger of the gun. So, this is the trigger. And the deformity here again is the patient will have a flexion deformity of their digit. So, that they cannot pass, sometimes they cannot even passively extend the digit. But once an attempt is done to passively extend the digit, it will fire like a pistol. Tuck. That is why it is known as a trigger finger. The patient will have a flexion deformity and once you try to extend it, it extends with a snap. So, that is why it is known as a trigger finger. Now, what is the pathology there? The fingers has got, uh, of course, the flexor tendons are being surrounded by annular pulleys as well as cruciate pulleys. There are five annular pulleys and three cruciate pulleys. Do not go into detail. So, trigger finger is the affliction of first annular pulley or the A1 pulley. Okay. So, that is the classical affected tendon. Stenosing tenovaginitis of the flexor tendon where the A1 pulley is getting fibro. So, that is your pathology for trigger finger. Now, what happens? I told you this is a disease of the middle-aged females or the housewives where the patient can have a locking of the finger in flexion and extension will bring up in a snap. So, that is the cl clinical features for you. You can rightly see over the diagram, this is the A1 pulley. So, this is your A1 pulley. So, that is the stenosing part where the tendon gets uh, jammed in underneath that pulley. Now, uh, clinically you can uh, examination diagnosis, you can have all those triggering uh, elicitation in, the, in your OPD and radiology really does not have a role, you do not have any bony abnormalities as such. Management, you can try some stretching exercises, but at some point of time when the uh, joint becomes completely in a flexed attitude where you, you cannot even correct it passively, you may have to go and divide this pulley, the pulley excision or the A1 pulley release. So, that is the trigger finger. Decurvance disease is another very important terminology, very favorite uh, you know qu uh, question for all those your examination. Finger decurvance disease. The buzzword is first extensor compartment. So it is the stenosing tenosynovitis of the first dorsal compartment, and you must be thorough with your dorsal compartment. There are six extensor compartments: one, two, three, four, five, six. One is your extensor pollicis brevis and the abductor pollicis longus. Two is your extensor carpi radialis brevis and the longus. Three is your APL. Four is your extensor digitorum to your fingers. Five is your extensor uh, digitae minimae, and finally the extensor carpi ulnar. So these are the six compartments, and decurvance disease is the stenosing tenosynovitis of the first dorsal compartment. So, you have to mention those which have the muscles in the first dorsal compartment, abductor pollicis longus as well as your extensor pollicis brevis. Now, uh, the etiology I told you this is a disorder of your, uh, you know, uh, middle-aged females, your mothers, our, the housewives. So, they use the repeated overuse injury so that the tendon gets continuously rubbed over with the radial styloid and finally the tendon sheath gets inflamed. So, repeated overuse is a causative factor and clinical features another important buzzword for decurvance disease Fingelstein's test Fingelstein's test very important so what uh, how you perform a Fingelstein test you tell the patient to keep the thumb inside your palm and tell them to grasp it and then ulnarly deviate it so that there will be stretch over the first dorsal compartment that can create excruciating pain over the radial style also or so, that is your classical fingers you can write this over the diagram. So, that is one uh, clinical feature in case of a uh, decurvance disease as well as you can feel a tenderness over the radial steroid. Here you can feel a tenderness. Now, treatment again you can give some rest, some amount of analgesic, some amount of night splinting for your uh, affected thumb. But in case the disease is uh, refractory with the conservative management, you may have to go for a 
sheath excision or the division of the first dorsal compartment sheath. So that is decurvens tenosynovitis. Going and gamekeeper's thumb or skier's thumb. So who is a skier? Who is a gamekeeper who traps all those animals inside and they are they used to squeeze or even twist the neck of the small animals. So it's quite even though it's quite cruel, uh, it's uh, you know unfortunately it's nameless gamekeeper or the skier's thumb. So the gamekeeper will squeeze the neck of all those uh, birds uh, like your, you, you can just imagine that of a hen or a cock. So once you twist what happens, the twisting injury will cause the thumb. So the twisting is like this, no? You twist like this, twist like this. The thumb is getting abducted like this so that the ulnar collateral ligament, the medial part, the ulnar collateral ligament of the first MCP joint is injured. So that is the affected structure in case of a gamekeeper's thumb. So UCL injury of the thumb MCP joint. I told you the mode of injury is skying or kind of gamekeeping. Now pain and sometimes instability, the thumb will be like unstable, it will go like this, this, this and that. So that is the instability of the thumb MCP joint. X-rays doesn't have a role, MRI might be necessary in times to know whether it is a partial injury or a complete injury. So MRI forms an important part of the investigation. And management, you can, in case of partial rupture, you can give a thumb spiker plaster, thumb spiker splint, so that uh, the partially ruptured or the partially sprained ligament will get healed. But in case it is a complete rupture, it is very unlikely for it to heal by this conservative techniques where you may have to go for an open repair or reconstruction. So that is quite easy. Operation for complete rup uh, rupture or rip and uh, non-surgical management for a partial rupture. Complication part you have to know another important word, Steiner's lesion, Steiner, S-T-E-N-E-S, Steiner's lesion. So that is the adductor pollicis aponeurosis. The adductor pollicis aponeurosis will come and lie in between the tendon and the bone so that the tendon, uh, so that uh, in between the ligament, the torn ligament, UCL, the ulnar collateral ligament and the bone so that the ulnar collateral ligament cannot come and heal over the base of the thumb. So this is an absolute indication for surgery. So Steiner's lesion is another important uh, terminology with regard to this uh, game keeper thumb. So you can write this over the diagram. This is the affected part. This is the ulnar collateral ligament which gets ruptured in case of a game keeper's thumb. Now ganglion. Ganglion, the first, I think you, I don't know, you, many of you might have even uh, get affected with the ganglion. Ganglion is a common swelling of the dorsum of the wrist. I have seen too many kids, uh, kids in the age group of 20 to 30 years of age or even 30 to 40. So this is a, one of the commonest benign swelling of the dorsum of the hand. Commonest benign swelling of the dorsum of the hand or the soft tissue swelling. So what exactly happens is that some amount of the synovial fluid will leak from the wrist joint like the scapholunite joint or even from the or, or, or in from the tendon sheath. So, some amount of fluid will leak and get outpouched to form a small soft tissue swelling or a you know cystic kind of swelling of the dorsum of the wrist or even the flexor aspect as well. So, you can see over the diagram, you can see, you can LCD easily, LCD, you can easily see a swelling of the dorsum of the wrist where the anatomy is being depicted very nicely over the screen like the a small outpouching of the synovium from the synovial fluid from the joint. So that is the classical ganglion which is many a time it gets uh, self limited, it gets disappeared by itself. Sometimes it may cause pain or tenderness, sometimes it gets increased in size and in some patients it uh, become, becomes a really uh, big annoyance and so that they will go for a surgical management like the excision of the swelling. So that is the excision but most often it is self limiting. So ganglion common soft tissue swelling of the dorsum of the hand versus a mucoid degeneration of the tendon sheath or the joint capsule where the synovial fluid gets leaked or outpouched into a small pouch lying outside the joint. Now carpal tunnel syndrome very important uh, you know short note as well as a uh, practical session question. Carpal tunnel syndrome again you might be really aware about all those things. I will just help you how to write a short note regarding carpal tunnel syndrome. So in writing an answer for carpal tunnel syndrome you must mention some point regarding the anatomy of the carpal tunnel. What is a carpal tunnel? Where does it lie? What are the boundaries of a carpal tunnel? Which is the nerve which is affected in carpal tunnel? It is, of course it is a median nerve. It is a compressive or entrapment neuropathy of the median nerve. That is the classical description of a carpal tunnel syndrome. Entrapment or the compressive neuropathy of the median nerve the carpal tunnel. Commonly the etiology is idiopathic, you never know what exactly is the reason but anything which can cause an increase in pressure inside the carpal tunnel like uh, any swelling, any edema, any injuries, any wrist fractures which increases the swelling, any uh, like the ganglion or any other tendon sheath or tenosynovitis can cause a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. 
clinical features of course uh, i told you these are all uh, the uh, all those housewives are getting for middle aged females where you can have the affliction in the median nerve distribution the lateral three fingers you can have numbness or some kind of burning kind of sensation over the lateral three fingers and clinical signs you can elicit is the phalanx test you might have seen many of your uh, senior faculty eliciting this test of your patients by asking them to keep their palms like this this is the classical phalanx test where you increase the pressure of the carpal tunnel by keeping the wrist in a position and uh, waiting for 30 seconds to 1 minute time if the symptoms are reproduced that is uh, your phalanx test is positive or otherwise it is an uh, durkens compression test where you just keep a finger pressure over uh, just medial to the flexor carpi radialis tendon and keep it for 30 seconds to 1 minute time and if the symptoms are reproduced it is again indicative for the carpal tunnel syndrome investigations x rays and uh, all those things really doesn't have a role unless you suspect any bony pathology or any recent injuries where nerve conduction studies all those peripheral nerve lesions you have to go for a nerve conduction whether electromyography and those uh, conduction velocity assessment and finally treatment part you can try for night splints with all those analgesic medications but if the uh, pain is not really you have to release the pressure inside the carpal tunnel by deroofing the carpal tunnel you just excess the transverse carpal ligament so that uh, compresses your carpal syndrome but i will just and discuss regarding the anatomy of the carpal tunnel so its borders its floor is formed by the carpal bones you can see over the diagram there so this is the floor formed by the carpal bones and the roof is by the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal which is mainly the culprit which causes the increase in the pressure so this is the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligament which is the structure we incise during the surgical management or the deroofing of the carpal tunnel now contents of carpal tunnel is again a favorite mcq for your pg entrance exam so it has got nine tendons it's very easy for fdps for to all those medial four uh, fingers and four fds the flexor digitorum profundus and fds for all the three medial four medial fingers plus one is the epl for plus the flexor tendon of the thumb so what where does the, what are the structures lying outside the carpal tunnel it's the flexor carpi ulnaris as well as the ulnar nerve so this is a favorite question like uh, what are the structures going below the carpal tunnel or underneath the carpal tunnel which is the structure out, which lies outside the carpal tunnel all these questions can arise in your mcqs now etiology i told you i have seen etiology being asked as a separate question for carpal tunnel syndrome so i told you it's commonly idiopathy commonest cause is idiopathy but again inflammatory arthritis like the rheumatoid arthritis wrist osteoarthritis anything which increases the pressure inside the carpal tunnel like distal radius fractures or bone thickening after colitis fracture and endocrine causes like the mixed edema all can cause acromegalis all can cause you know uh, the pressure inside increase the pressure inside the carpal tunnel and lead to carpal tunnel syndrome so that forms the carpal tunnel syndrome you, for you guys hopefully it's not a difficult topic to remember as such it's just the compressive entrapment neuropathy of the medial nerve inside the carpal tunnel now going ahead duputrans contracture duputrans contracture is again a very important short note and you must be aware about what exactly a duputrans contracture means so definition it is the proliferative fibroplasia of the palmar aponeurosis and the culpr and the proliferative cell lineage is the myofibroblast again another mcq for your pg entrance exam so proliferative fibroplasty of the palmar aponeurosis this thickening of the hand is the palmar aponeurosis over your sole you have the plantar aponeurosis so this palmar aponeurosis gets five prolif there will be proliferative fibroplasty of the uh, palmar aponeurosis that is the classical pathological finding seen in duputrans contraction pathology males epileptics alcoholics are commonly seen affected so mainly all those are rough rough skinned people uh, the males the epileptics and alcoholics are frequently seen affected with a duputrans contraction and clinical features mainly the ring finger is commonly affected so that's another important mcq ring finger is the commonly affected uh, finger in case of a duputrans contraction where you have the once the palmar aponeurosis is contracted you will have a flexion contracture of the mcp joint as well as the pip joint so the, the patient will be almost looking like a claw hand kind of Uh, clinical scenario associations is another important topic uh, you must be aware regarding the associations of duputrans contracture where i told you the plantar aponeurosis sometimes get affected it's known as a leder host disease as well as in case of penile fascia affecting it is the peyronie so these are all our mcqs so you must be re- revising this again and again so that these names get stuck into your brain management part uh, you can try some stretching exercises and radiotherapy in the initial stages for duputrans contracture but once the deformity is fixed kind of this one you have to go for a fasciotomy fasciectomy me all those different kinds of procedures so either you go for a needling like a fasciotomy you make multiple punctures in the fascia or just excise the fascia either partial or complete so to put trans contraction is another very important short note where your buzzwords lies in the proliferative fibroplasia of the palmar aponeurosis as well as ring finger is the commonest uh, finger affected 
Now, uh, going ahead, the tenosynovitis again, yeah, this is like tenosynovitis means tenosynovium, the synovial lining of the tendon, the tendon sheath, itis inflammation. So, it is just inflammation of the synovial lining of your tendon. So, inflammation of the thin synovial lining of tendon sheath is the tenosynovitis. The only point to remember regarding tenosynovitis is canavel sign. Canavel sign I have discussed in the next slide where uh, you can see the canavels. So, this is the canavels for cardinal signs for you. Memorize that, try to memorize that picture over the screen. So, the affected finger is slightly held in flexion because this the flexor tenosynovitis, you cannot stretch it, it will cause pain. So, the finger will be in a slight attitude of flexion. There will be fusiform swelling of the affected tendon tenderness over the affected tendon and any attempt in passive extension will cause excruciating pain. So, these are the four cardinal signs or the canavel sign for tenosynovitis is again a favorite MCQ for your future exams. So, uh, these four the attitude of uh, mild flexion, the fusiform swelling, tenderness along the flexor tendon as well as pain on passive extension. So, these are the classical features for a tenosynovitis. Again, building a short note for you, pathology mostly can be infective like the Staphylococcus oris is the most commonly associated organism whereas, um, sometimes it can cause with the irritative action like repeated microtrauma. Clinical features we have already discussed. Investigation, you can rule out infection by uh, doing all those inflammatory parameters like the ESR, uh, the C-reactive proteins, etc. Management. You can try antibiotic management if the lesion is not that severe, it is not that tense and all. But sometimes it will be quite reddish and pus pointing out. You may have to do an incision and drainage. So, either you go for antibiotics as well as the incision and drainage. Complication, of course, the tendon uh, once uh, gets scarred, it will lead to all those additions of the tendon. So, that uh, there will be additions or even rupture of the flexor tendons. That includes the complications. So, tenosynovitis is just like Canavel's cardinal signs for you guys. Other things are all what, whatever small inf infective tendinitis or synovial sheath inflammation. Now, compound palmar ganglion, right from the name compound. So, how is it called compound? You know, one dorsal wrist ganglion we have already discussed. But why is this known as a compound palmar ganglion? It is known as compound because both the wrist as well as the palm is involved. So, that is why it is known as a compound palmar ganglion and your buzzwords for compound palmar ganglion is tuberculosis as well as rheumatoid arthritis. So, commonly tuberculosis but these two are the buzzwords for a compound palmar ganglion which is an essential part of your short note. Now, going to the anatomy, it is the tenosynovitis of the flexor tendon sheath of the forearm at the level of wrist. So, the tendon sheath like the canavel sign in the digits, you will have the flexor tendon tenosynovitis at the level of the wrist. So, that it will get communicated across the palm as well. So, that makes it known as pa compound palmar ganglion and there will be an hourglassing cell because the transverse carpal ligament is here, there will be a small area of uh, constriction there, but then it again forms a swelling in the mid palmar area. So, that forms a fusiform hourglass shaped swelling and it can elicit cross fluctuation. Once you press here, you can feel the pulse over the distal part. So, this again forms an imp very important clinical features for uh, compound palmar ganglion, hourglass swelling and cross fluctuation. Of course, non-operative management you can give without anti-tuberculous therapies for tuberculous patients as well as for rheumatoid arthritis you go for the drugs or the disease modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs. But in case it is tuberculosis and causing carpal tunnel syndrome or all those compressive symptoms you may have to go for a open uh, synovectomy and sending the tissue for biopsy as well to classically grow the tubercle bacilli. Complications I told you it can cause a compressive symptom like the carpal tunnel syndrome where you can have a median nerve pulsing. So, in case uh, you are doing operating a patient on uh, tuberculous compound palmar ganglion, you will have the classical melon seed bodies intraoperatively. So, that is another important terminology in case of a compound palmar ganglion, melon seed bodies. So, compound palmar ganglion is just a palmar ganglion like your dorsal ganglion, but it is compound, it is communicating with the palmar space as well as the wrist. So, flexor tenosynovitis either due to tuberculosis or due to rheumatoid arthritis communicating across the palm forming an hourglass swelling with a elicitation of a cross fluctuation management by DMARDs or the anti-tuberculous therapies as well as open cyanobacteria. Peronychia, peronychia again uh, many of us will be get affected with uh, this peronychia where it is the infection of the nail fold or otherwise known as the eponychia. So, commonest infection of the hand and it is the infection of the nail fold or the eponychium. You can see over the diagram there. So, this part, this, this nail fold part, so this overlying nail fold part is the 
aponychium. So this is the aponychium and this is in, it is that part which gets affected or more mainly due to frequent wetting of the fingers or the moisturizing surfaces you come into contact for frequent like our um, elderly mothers or even the housewives who keep or even some detergent allergies can cause. So an acute infection of a peron uh, acute infection is caused by the Staphylococcus aureus whereas a chronic infection I told you regarding all those uh, housewives the common organisms found is candida or the fungus. So that is an important short note, acute case staph aureus whereas in chronic case it is the candida. Clinical features of course you know you, the nail bed will be swell and there will be pain, there will be tenderness etc etc and um, radiology does not have really have a role. Ma management again you can try for some antifungal or antibiotic management and in case the swelling is not getting subsided you may have to do an incision and drainage where you do a mar superialization. Uh, you can see the over the diagram, so you put an incision over either side of your aponychia and then flip it so that the pus gets drained. Sometimes you have to suture it again that is known as the mar superialization really need not worry regarding that you just write incision and drainage or antibiotic management for peronychia. Complication again this infection can extend deep into the nail bed or even the distal interphalagian joint can cause pulp space infection or an osteomyelitis or sometimes can cause a chronic peronychium where the commonest organism is the candida. So peronychia is infection of the nail fold otherwise known as aponychium it can be either acute staph aureus or chronic candida. So before going to volar space infection has seen once uh, the question being asked as a volar space infection. So that is why I am discussing this volar space anatomy. It can be either proximal, middle or distal. So it is quite simple. Proximal to the middle uh, uh, flex, uh, finger crease is the proximal space. In between the proximal and the distal volar crease of the finger is the middle volar space and distal to the distal digital crease is the uh, distal volar space or the pulp space. Okay. So uh, in case the volar space infection is asked as such volar space infection just discuss regarding this anatomy the volar space can be either proximal, middle or distal and just write regarding the anatomy like uh, the borders. Now this is the common short note or the favorite favorite question for the exam the terminal pulp space or the distal volar space infection or otherwise known as felon f e l o n the terminal pulp space infection the part distal to the distal digital crease so immediately after the peronychia felon is the commonest hand infection being come across so the classical anatomy of the pulp space is that it has got multiple fibrous septae right from the skin going down to the periosteum of the distal phalanx. So you can see how the diagram there are multiple uh, fibrous septae growing down, going down from the skin to the periosteum of the bone. So this forms multiple tiny tiny compartments and any collection or any abscess formation in this tiny compartment can cause excruciating pain so that uh, the release of the pulp space will help in some symptoms. So that's this is the basic of fear or terminal pulp space infection but writing a short note you have to write that this is the infection affecting the pulp space, the pulp space anatomy distal to distal digital crease and the uh, second commonest infection after the peronychia. Now common mode of injury is the pinprick infection, the pulp is swollen, tense, tender, reddish everything will be there. And non-operative when you can try for antibiotics but if it is so tense, it is so uh, the pus is pointing you may have to go for an incision and drainage. Complication again the infection can extend into the bone to cause an osteomyelitis of the distal interphalangeal joint or even the DAP joint septic arthritis. Sometimes the tendon sheath or the tendon gets affected causing a tenosynovitis. So that finishes our uh, important session on hand. So I have covered some 14-15 topics in this session you might be remembering but it is uh, not like a one time reading chapter or one time reading session. This needs multiple reading. All those topics had to get stuck once hearing the gamekeeper come the ulnar collateral ligament might, must come to your hand. Hearing a mallet finger the distal the extensor tendon has to be their jersey finger you must know it is the FDP evolution. Uh, so all those things has to be stuck to your brain because these are quite uh, you know very important topics but you need not brainstorm too much in detail regarding each topic. So uh, do a repeated reading, do repeated listening and discuss with your friends to get the topic stuck to your brain. So thanks for listening, hope uh, to catch you with another topic in the next session. Thank you. Dokumi.